Oh, hi everyone, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Take 5 of Don't Miss This This Week. It has week. been quite the recording. Y'all, but here we go. Fifth time's a charm, as they say. We're excited to jump in today <laughs> to Enos Jerem Omni and Words of Mormon. This is... Uh, um, if you are new, we move through the scriptures. This is a scripture study class. That's what we're doing. And uh, we talk about things we think you don't want to miss. And uh, just the, the gems, man. The highlights and just really cool things that are in the scriptures. The things that we think kind of help them come alive. And, and also teaching tips and, and things that we would do in classes or personal study. And anyways, we're so happy that you're here. We're jumping in to looks like a lot of friends. And it is. You, you're actually meeting way more friends than you're ready to meet today. There's True. probably, in this section, there are more people that you meet than any other probably section of scripture. This is the end of the small plates of the Book of Mormon. Um, we'll kind of, let's maybe get into that when we do Words of Mormon. Yeah. Um, and then so we'll you'll jump learn. In. Don't yeah. worry. We'll Don't jump into Enos, uh, Jacob's son. Um, last time we were Jacob, and then now his boy. he passes on the plates to his son Enos. So let's jump into this first part. Um, the first day's reading is Enos 1, 1 through 14. Enos is only one chapter, so it's pretty simple. But the other day I heard about this fight. It's called the Rumble in the Jungle, and <laughs> it's between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. But the thing is, is that at this point when they began, like when the fight and the hype and everything was going on, Muhammad Ali was kind of washed. Like it was like he had been like well past his prime. There were new people that were better boxers that were kind of going in. There were better fighters all around, and he was kind of like at the end of his era. But like because he was so good, at, like his name still meant something. And so when he was gonna fight, it was still a big deal. But everyone kind of was like, "Is he good? Even like is it like he might not be able to compete anymore?" And he was versing George Foreman, who I just barely did learn that he was a creator of the grill, the George Foreman grill, no problem. But he does both. <laughs> that was uh, take four. Yeah, so <laughs> just so <perfect>. you know. <laughs> so that's perfect. Me but teaching before that, <laughs> that George Foreman. <laughs> And the George Foreman Grill are the same individual. Same guy. Who knew? Who knew? Not me. Um, but before he made the grill, he was a fighter. And he was super, <laughs> super good. And what happened is they had this fight. It was called the Rumble in the Jungle. And before it happened, everyone kind of went into the fight knowing George Foreman was going to win. He was better, he was faster, he was stronger. He was in the height, the peak of his career. And Muhammad Ali was kind of like, oh, well, big a name to fight. Legend. Yeah, a yeah. big name to fight. And so they get there and everyone's doing press conferences and they're like, Muhammad Ali, like, what are you going to do? How are you going to fight differently this time? Like, this is a new fight for you. And he just looked at him and he's like, I'm going to do what I've always done. Like, I'm going to be faster, I'm going to be stronger, I'm going to go in, I'm going to like hit first, hit hardest, I'm like going to go for it. And everyone kind of was like, okay, yeah, like hopefully that goes well for you. And the problem was is that he wasn't going to be able to hit as hard as George Foreman. He wasn't going to be able to be as fast as George Foreman. He di it didn't look promising. And so everyone went into the fight and they're like, we're going to watch this, but it might be a brutal one. Like it's not going to look super good. And what happens is like right now when I'm telling the story, you're like, oh, but he's going to be good because he's the legend. But the problem was is that he wasn't. Like the first four rounds, he was getting destroyed. Just absolutely worked in this fight. And George Foreman was hitting him way more than he could ever hit him. He was getting destroyed by him over and over and over, round after round after round. By round four, it was like, I wonder how many people wanted to stop watching and just be like, this is over. Like, this is a disaster. He's a better fight than you. Like, you might have been good at some point, but not anymore. And it's so interesting because Enos starts out um, with a fight. And in verse number two, he's going to say, listen, I'm Enos. I'm Jacob's boy. My dad raised me to be a good kid. I knew what to do in life. He told me what to do to have a relationship with God. I was raised how he wanted to be raised in a good, good way. But what happens in verse number two is he says, I'm going to tell you about the wrestle which I had before God. And it's so interesting because that automatically implies if your wrestle is before God, you are not fighting God. Mm -hmm. You are fighting something else. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that I think instantly in our head, once the wrestle becomes against something, you start filling in the blanks of like, what could he have been fighting? Maybe it was a trial. Maybe it was a sin. Maybe it was temptation. Maybe it was disappointment. Maybe it was discouragement. We have these battles, these wrestles in our hearts. 
And it's so interesting to me because sometimes we think we're fighting God. And I think that might be Satan's biggest trick. He is really good at fighting. He has fought for a lot longer than I have been doing this fight. He has been in the ring far more times than I have. In all reality, I am facing like the fight for my heart and your heart is not a fair fight because the person we're fighting against has been fighting for hearts since the beginning of time. And I am 24 years into this. He's been fighting a lot longer than I have, even a lot longer than Enos had been fighting. And it's interesting because he gives you a clue about what the fight was in verse number three. And he says, I decided to go hunting. I needed a day in the wilderness. I needed to get out of my own head. I needed to get out of my own routine because the fight was kind of overtaking him. And I think that you get a clue into what the fight was at the end of verse number three. Because he went into the woods to hunt, thinking about something specific. That he had often heard his dad speak about eternal life and the joy of the saints. And if that's something he's clinging on to, I wonder if joy wasn't something he was feeling. Mm. And maybe that was the wrestle all along. The Enos had felt like, I'm doing everything right. I'm trying my very hardest. I'm following all the commandments. And my dad keeps telling me that people should be happy when they're doing these things. Mm. And why wasn't he? What was missing there? And all of a sudden, this wrestle that he had been having took him into the wilderness. He said, I've got to figure this out. I love in verse number four that it says his soul hungered. I would circle that a million times because that feels like something to me. When I read that, I don't just read words. I feel emotion. That's how you know he was in the middle of a fight. Is because his soul hungered for more. You hear it in him. You can feel this emotion of a boy that is desperate to figure out how to win a fight. That's why he went to the woods in the first place. Because he said, I'm taking a lot of punches right now. And I've got to figure out what to do. And you see it more the longer you go through. Because he's going to tell you what he did for his soul. He starts praying. And he prays all day long. And then all night long. You are not just praying for something you don't care about if it's going to take you all day and all night. Mm -hmm. That has got to be something that is eating away at your soul. That you're like, I have got to figure this out. I'm not getting off my knees until I figure this out. And it's interesting because I just can't help but think of a connection there. That when you're losing a fight, you usually end up on your knees. And I love, like a physical fight, you're going to end up on your knees And I love that the battle that you're facing is probably best fought on your knees. Mm -hmm. And Enos is going to show you that. And it looks a little bit different. Because when he was getting worked, that's where he went. He said, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to stay there all day because this is a fight I cannot lose. It's too important. And he prays and he prays and he prays. And then all of a sudden in verse number five, he gets his answer. A voice came unto him saying, Enos, your sins are forgiven and you will be blessed. And you just know the heart of this boy in verse number six. I, Enos, knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away in an instant. He said, I trust that. I believe it. But he did still wonder, how is it done? How is that possible? How could you do that? And there's just something about this story that makes a lot more sense to me when you read verse number eight. Because his answer is because of your faith in Christ, who you have never before heard or seen. And that could mean a whole lot of things, but I can't help but wonder if maybe Enos grew up with a dad like Jacob, who he knew had seen and heard the Lord. Mm. And I wonder if that boy was wrestling with the fact that he had felt like he hadn't. And why hadn't God talked to him? And why hadn't God spoken to him and why had he never seen it? Why had he never had these experiences? And if all the other people are feeling joy and communicating with divinity, why couldn't he? And I love that God instantly in one second changed the narrative. And he said, listen, you changed the way you were fighting. You got a new game plan and it looks different than the people that you have grown up with, but it is the perfect one for you. Hmm. And it might have not been what you expected, but it is exactly what you needed. And it's interesting because what happened in the rumble in the jungle is in round five, 
Um, Muhammad Ali had spent the majority of the time just getting worked, like, on the outside of the ring. And all of a sudden, in round five, George Foreman got a little bit tired. And it seemed like he was going to win, and it seemed like it was going to be easy. But the thing was, is Muhammad Ali decided to change his game plan. And he saw that he was getting tired, and he said, wait, I can do this now. This is round one for me. He's been fighting for a long time, but this is my first round. And he starts going when George Foreman's tired, and then the next round, and then the next round. And by round eight, in the craziest comeback, he takes him to the ground. It's a knockout, and he wins. And is something to be said about him realizing that he was losing the fight, but that the outcome was already, he, like the outcome wasn't already spoken. He still had a chance. That even if people stopped watching and they thought, you don't stand a chance, like no way. He said, all I need to do is change my plan. And I think that maybe that is a good lesson for the fight and the wrestles we're in. Mm. That to be honest, the victory has already been won. But maybe we need to change our game plan halfway through. Yeah, and I think maybe like one thing I would think about is first and foremost, take it before God. And and sometimes, I don't know, I I, I had this little like um, word, uh, I don't know what it is, game. It's not a game, it's not a game. It's this idea where we say, I fi- I'm fighting with God. And you could either be fighting with him or he could be on your team. With could be with can either mean opponent or with can mean teammate. Mm. And just this idea that I say to myself sometimes is like your fight is not with God. It is with God. And to take your take it before him, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is that's hard, that seems like the 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 game plan, right? Fight, like take it, like bring him into it. That's what that phrase kind of means to me when I took this before God. I just said, listen, I need your, I need your help on this. I need, um, I need your strength in this. And I also love what you said about, do you remember there, there's that old, old, old seminary video that is based off the story that they made? I mean, it's just these boys are on a campfire or something. That's all I can remember. It's older than the rumble of the jungle. But, <laughs> but um, there's a line, they sing this song, and today it's probably a little bit cheesy, but... There's a line in the song that says, when I learned to feel what I already knew, Mm. that he seems to have that moment where it's just like, it became real for him. And anyways, this is such an awesome, you'll probably um, take this chunk if you're teaching a lesson or something, and there's so many lessons on prayer in here. One of the things you might do is, is have people like read through those verses and find like the synonyms and the words that describe his, his prayer. Mm. Things like wrestle, things like I knelt down, things like I cried out mighty all day and all night, all of those kind of things. And then it's a great opportunity to really talk about what it looks like to bring God into a struggle or bring God into, into a wrestle. Mm. So anyways, really, really such a cool section. Now, what happens right after this is... Verse nine is this like transition verse where he says, it came to pass when I had heard these words that God had spoken to him. He says, I began to feel a desire for the welfare of my brethren. And I think that is, there is such a sweet connection there when he just, when I felt that God knew me, when I felt that God had forgiven my sins, immediately I began to feel that for other people. Right, where he's just like I'm thinking of that story of the parable of of the ten thousand talents, you know, that are forgiven of that man. Do you remember that Jesus tells mm. he has all oh, that huge debt, and he's forgiven of it, but then he goes out and he start and he like chokes out that guy who owes him like a hundred <laughs> bucks or something like that, like, you know. And every time when I there's a phrase at the end of that that makes you feel like the man didn't actually learn the lesson. He never he didn't feel it. He didn't feel a 10,000 talent forgiveness. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone and choked out that guy. In this book, you get the opposite of it. He feels forgiveness and all of a sudden, like he, his desire is to help and his desire is to reach out and, and take care of other people. And I want you to see, it's not just that. In verse nine, he began to feel a desire for his brethren. And so he did pour out his whole soul unto God for them now. And uh, I, I uh, th- this is on the little 
the challenge that you may see this week on your um, Read It, Live It calendar, uh, that you probably have somebody in mind that you are praying for right now. And I was just flipping through that and seeing that uh, the invitation is pour out your soul for them on a, on a particular day um, that it comes up or today, whenever. Um, but there's something about those words that are so sweet to me with prayer to just pour out every frustration, every heartache, every tear, every worry, every wonder, every, every, all of it, all of it, just lay all of it out before the Lord. And I think there's a hopeful, um, there's some hopeful verses ahead that say this because he's praying for them and, and, uh, he gets a promise from the Lord that he's going to take care of, of those people in verse 10. And then in verse 11, it says, then I had, after I had heard these words, my faith began to be unshaken in the Lord. And I prayed unto him with many long strugglings for my brethren, the Lamanites. So it's interesting. It's like, first he prays for himself. Then he prays for his friends and family. And now he starts praying for his enemies. And who he calls his brethren. Right. And you're going to find out in the rest of these like chapters that we're in today that they, they are not good neighbors or brothers. They're not anyone that you want at the, at the family Christmas party. Like, or who you would hear, claim as yours. Right, right. Like, you're like, you want to be like, I'm not related. That's not my... The description of them throughout these... You know, like, they drink blood. They run around naked. They eat animals raw. They're like... You're kind of like, oh, they, they love murder. It's one of the lines that's in there. And you're just like, who loves murder? <laughs> you know? And... The fact that he, something has happened in him that not only is he praying for him, but he's claiming them as his brethren. There's a mighty change of heart that's happened in this boy. And it says, he starts to pray for them. And it says in verse 12, it came to pass after I had prayed and labored with all diligence um, for the Lamanites. He says, the Lord said unto me, I will grant unto thee according to thy desires because of thy faith. And now because this was the desire which I desired of him, that if it should so be that my people would fall into transgression and be destroyed, that the Lord would preserve a record for my people, even if it so be by the power of his holy arm, that it might be brought forth in some future day unto the Lamanites, that perhaps they might be brought unto salvation. I, it's interesting to see this boy pray and just to say, just to re, a request that almost like it's a, a handing it over to him, mm. to the Lord. He was like, these are these people that I'm praying for, that it's not working. Whatever I'm doing is not helping. There's no change that's happening. And I don't see any change or any bright light at the end of the tunnel. So can I just hand this over to you? And he, the Lord promises him that he will. Wherefore, I knowing that the Lord God was able to do this. And I had faith, verse 16, and did cry unto God that he would preserve the records. And he covenanted with me that he would bring them forth unto the Lamanites in his due time. And I just, I think that is a sweet promise to anybody who is praying for someone right now with no happy, um, happily ever after insight and no light at the end of the tunnel. If you are praying for a friend or a family member or a child or a parent, that you just, you're like, I, <laughs> nothing, nothing is, is happening. I feel like the promise in here is a promise for you. That you can hand that over to the Lord and he covenants that in his own due time, he'll find a way to reach out to them. He'll find a way to preserve them still. And Enos rests in that. Verse 17 Enos knew it would be according to the covenant which he had made. Wherefore, my soul did rest. Um, of course, he says, verse 20, we're still going to seek diligently to restore the Lamanites unto the true faith in, in God. We're, I'm not going to give up on doing it, but my soul can rest in the covenants of the Lord that he's promised not to abandon those I love, that he's still going to reach out in his own due time. And we can rest in his, right? His, his promise that I, um, 
there's that verse. I wrote it as a footnote somewhere else, but I'm going to find it. I think in Philippians, I think it's in Philippians 1, Philippians 1, 6, that promise that Paul teaches that the God who's begun a work is able to finish it. And you might circle that word um, in 15. The Lord God was able. He's able to do this. Verse 16, the line, in his own due time, verse 17, I knew it and my soul did rest in that. And uh, I think there's just something really sweet and special about that for anybody struggling with someone or something that you're, you're praying for. You're, you can still keep trying, but your soul can be at rest because of who promised, right? And even it just makes me, verse number 17, even just all by itself makes me want to think if I see my covenants the same way. Is if when I think about my covenants and I remember my covenants, I want to live those in rest. Mm. Because I think sometimes we think about our covenants and it's a to-do list of, okay, I have to be living my covenants. And sometimes when you have to be living something, it seems exhausting. And you're like, well, I have so much to do already. And I love that Enos' covenants did require something of him. You see that in the later verses that he really was going to work diligently about it. But I love that his soul found rest in them. Mm. And I think that would be a really cool study to like, just like think about, okay, where do I find rest in my covenants? Mm. Because I think that you'd live your covenants better if you first found rest in them. Yeah. Well, and I think, and I think part of that is remembering not just my part of the covenant relationship, but God's part of the covenant relationship. Yes. I think he's finding rest in like God's ability and God's compassion and God's character and God's wisdom. And that is where he's like, I believe in a God who will fulfill and do what he's covenanted and promised to do in his own time, but able like those, are, those two principles, like those two lessons go together that he is able and in his own time. And if I know that I'm not demanding a timeline, but I am resting in his ability and his willingness to, you know, to do what he said he would do. Hmm. And um, I, I, so the rest of the chapter, he, he just talks about that, what that looks like, right? He rests in that promise, but he still reaches out. He still tries. In verse 23, he says, sometimes it was nothing but harshness and, and pro- preaching and prophesying about wars and reminding them of, of like penalty, you know, of like the dangers of living in a certain way. I mean, he's kind of in misery prevention mode as a prophet here. He's like, listen, I'm just trying to like <laughs> prevent you from um, ruining your lives. And he just seems to live his whole life out trying and doing anything and everything he can to help in the rescue. And, and I think it's because he experienced it in the woods. He's like, I knelt down in mighty prayer and uh, these words sunk deep into my heart and my guilt was washed away and my connection with God was authentic and it was real. And like the sons of Mosiah later in the book, he's like, I I wanted it for every single person. So he says at the very, very end in 26, I saw I must soon go down to my grave, having been wrought upon by the power of God that I must preach and prophesy unto this people. And declare the word according to the truth which is in Christ. And I have declared it in all my days and have rejoiced in it above that of the world. And I think it's maybe a cool question to ask yourself and think, what truth about Christ have you rejoiced in? Which truth about who he is and what he's done and what he's promised to do is one that just like lights you on fire and then say like Enos, declare it all your days. Like that's how he spent his whole life. My whole day was, was, was praising him. My whole life was praising him. And then 27, this is like, remember you're talking about going to bed on your mission, smiling mm-hmm. like a uh, last lesson or a couple yeah. lessons ago or whenever that was. This is what that reminds me of, like not just at the end of a day, but he's about to put his head on on the pillow at the end of his life. And he says, I soon go to the place of my rest, which is with my Redeemer, for I know that in him I shall rest. And I rejoice in the day when my mortals shall put on immortality and I'll stand before him. Then shall I see his face with pleasure. And he will say unto me, come unto me, you blessed there's a place prepared for you in the mansions of my father. Oh, to imagine that that day, what it will be like to 
walk back into the presence of the Father and the Son who, who you've loved and proclaimed their name and who, who you found rest with in this life. And so you expect that same kind of rest in the next one. And there's just something, there's that, it's just a sweet moment um, uh, to anticipate and one that we all get to experience someday. And I love that it says, there's a place prepared for you in the mansions of my father. Because when you have someone coming over, when you expect someone, you get something ready for them. Mm. And you say, oh, I'm going to make the bed and I'm going to clean the sheets and I'm going to make sure it's really nice in my house because you're expecting them. And I wonder if at the beginning of this chapter, Enos wouldn't have expected that Heavenly Father would be up there expecting him to come back. Mm. And I love that by the end, in his very last moments, he said, you know what? He's already prepared something. He knew all along, this is where I was going to end up. And he got it ready for me. He expected me to come back home. Yeah. And I just think that's so cute that he just prepared his place for him. Yeah, it's really sweet. And the thing too that... He's prepared it for whoever he was praying for also. Yeah. And he's like, he's like I, I still have rest that God's going to continue this, that story with them. That, that it's not over, right? That he's, he's, the story for those people is not over either. And, and he's preparing something for them. And God didn't and, send you to earth expecting you not to come home. Yeah. Anyone, he, not yeah, anyone. Yeah. Right. He just, he already has your place. He's getting it ready for you to come back. It's so awesome. It's so cute. It's just so sweet. Um, the next little book is the book of Jerem. Jerem is Enos' son, and he starts writing next. And David kind of already mentioned this, but there is like, this is one of those chapters that you start really seeing the state of the people in like that, like the people that they were worried about and the people they were praying about and the people they were trying to help. And like you see it in already in verse number three. They, the hardness of their hearts, the deafness of their ears, the blindness of their minds, the stiffness of their necks. You see this, like, they build you and paint you a picture of these people who didn't care to listen, who didn't even want to try to be better, that it was just like, oh my goodness, there's not even a desire in them to try to figure something out. It's just like, oh, we couldn't care less. We're not going to look, we're not going to hear, we're not going to try to change our ways. Like, we're just living in this mess. And verse number three says something that's so fascinating to me because when you hear the state of those people, you might think they are too far gone. Mm -hmm. They are too far gone. They don't care. They don't even want it. And that is not what Jerem says. He does not say, let me tell you about this people. They are too far gone. Instead, he completely switches the narrative and he says, behold, it is expedient. We cannot wait because much should be done among this people. This is not a they are too far gone. This is a commission for a lot to be done. Mm. And I think that sometimes, even when I look at my own life, I think I am too far gone. That's not going to work out. And I love that God's whisper back is, no, there's just a lot to be done. And I think that's something hopeful, not something like that weighs down. Because in a moment that you feel like you are too far gone, you don't really care what it will take. You just love that there's a way out. Mm. And from the beginning for Jerem, he looked at these people and he said, no, 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 they are not too far gone. We just have a lot of work to do. And I love that he ends that thought and he says, they are a mess and they don't care and they are not trying to listen right now. Nevertheless, God is exceedingly merciful unto them. Not God is exceedingly merciful unto us, but God is exceedingly merciful unto them. And if God is, why shouldn't we? And the more you learn about them, the more you're like, oh, that is really kind of a lot. Like you get down to verse number six and they were exceedingly more numerous than we, than were they of the Nephites. They had a ton of people and the people that they were, they loved murder, like David said, and oh, they would they drink are. the blood of beasts. <laughs> like, it's like, don't, they don't only just outnumber you, but they love to kill people and they also do drink the blood of beasts. Like, it's like you are, they paint this picture that you were like, uh, are you sure? Like, I'm like, And I wonder if that was part of like this moment that you couldn't just send anyone into that crowd. I wonder who would go because that's scary and that seems overwhelming. 
And when he says in verse number three that there's much to be done, by the time you get to verse number six, you are nodding your head and you are saying, yeah, there might be too much to be done. No way. Who will go? Who is willing to enter into that when you are outnumbered against people who love murder and are drinking blood? I don't want to. Who is going to go? And in verse number seven, he gives you the answer because he says, our kings and our leaders were mighty men in the faith of the Lord. And they taught the people the ways of the Lord. Wherefore, we withstood the Lamanites. And I love that the solution to being outnumbered by people that might have been scary or you were a little bit nervous or is like, oh, I don't know about them, was a few mighty people. They said, we are not afraid. We will be mighty in this fight. And it's not a fight against them, but a fight for their hearts, a fight for their soul. And that's a big fight. That's true. But that's why they're mighty. They weren't afraid of too much to be done. They said, oh no, we know there's a lot, but we're not scared of doing a lot. And that's kind of, I feel like, the, it's a kind of a theme for the rest of these sections of scripture. And what happens is we kind of made the worksheet after this. And it's these leadership principles about these mighty people. The kings and the leaders who were mighty, what does that look like? Because there's still a lot to be done. There is much to do. And if we're going to be a part of that, we better learn what it looks like to be mighty. And that's what's described. So that's the worksheet. There's a lot of different ones. They're going to go from Jerem all the way to Words of Mormon. And you're going to find more than what's written on here. As I studied, I did. And I just wrote it in the margins of mine. And that's perfect. You can do that same thing. We gave you little places to start. And the first one is in verse 7. But already by the time you're in verse 11, there's more. Because they're mighty, but then in verse 11, it starts explaining, and they did labor diligently and exhorted with all long suffering the people to diligence, teaching the law of Moses, persuading them to look forward to the Messiah, to believe in him that he would come. And in one verse, you already get a detailed description of what it looks like to become mighty and what the mighty people spend their days doing. They're working hard and they are cheering people up. They are going to people and saying, listen, let me teach you who we believe in and that he is coming and that he's better than anything you could ever imagine. And so that's the worksheet. You might just want to go through and say, what does it look like to become these mighty people? And I also in mine, once I started going through and was writing these, I started making a list of the mighty leaders in my life. And I just think there's something for the moments that we feel like we're too far gone. And realizing that God will send mighty people who are willing to work really hard for us to make us remember that the Messiah is coming and he already did come and he will come again over and over and over, not just to the earth, but to our own individual lives. And sometimes I just need a reminder of the mighty people that God has already sent. So maybe in the times that I feel like there's too, like I'm too far gone, I know who to reach out to. So you might want to do both on your worksheet. Make a list of what it looks like to be mighty and then think about who does that remind you of and should you write their names down next to that little box. Yeah, you know, when you just put this up, I started to think about, like, we called this one leadership principles. And I think right off the bat, when you think of the word leader, you think of somebody who's directing a cause or the boss of a, a movement or, or of an organization or something like that. But in that word itself, I've just been sitting here thinking about how um, everybody is a leader because of what that word means. A leader is one who leads to a place or in our circumstance here to a person. And so this is what a position doesn't make somebody a leader, but um, a, a call does, meaning like the Lord's call to us to like bring people to him, to lead someone. Lead, does, am I making sense? Yes. Like, no, it's really good. But, but I'm just like thinking in my mind, I was like, oh, for so long, I've thought about the word leader as somebody who was the boss instead of someone who genuinely just like, hey, takes somebody else by the hand and leads them to a place or to a a person. And Mm. so when you see leadership principles, don't dismiss that and say like, well, I'm not a leader. It's like, wait, do you not have the capability and the compassion uh, compassion and and the um, 
circumstances to lead somebody to Jesus. And this is what it, this is my, what it looks like. And that might be somebody who's also presiding, right, at the same time. But anybody and everybody can, can uh, be patient with others. But it's right? because there's so much work to be done. Right, right. And what that looks like, that looks like, you, you, like someone might say, well, I'm not the president of an organization. I was just like, oh, this, this is not for them. To lead people to Christ requires um, a mighty trust in the ways of God. It requires patience. It requires that you know what your intent is. It requires that you're persu- it requires persuasion. It requires cheering up. Yeah. And it requires hard work. And it requires teaching them about the Jesus that you know. I know. That part I love. The, I love that they're persuading in verse, in verse 11 to look forward to Christ. Like, oh, like, let me persuade you to believe in something better. So you're going to see this keep coming up throughout the entire lesson, but I just wanted to make sure we kept that in mind. It was like, wait, this is for anybody who wants to lead somebody else to, to the Savior. There's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. The good news is we can all learn how to together. Yeah. Okay. So the next little section is, starts the book of Omni. And you find out right at the very beginning that Omni is now the son of Jerem. And he's, a, he's going to move through this book, and we're going to move through several different people really quickly. But it's really interesting as you start reading about some of these people, some of them only get one verse. There's something I want to say about Omni, though, who says in verse 2, Wherefore, in my days, I would you should know that I fought much with the sword to preserve my people, the Nephites, from falling into the hands of our enemies. Behold, I have myself am a wicked man. And I've not kept the statutes and commandments of the Lord as I ought to have done. And, uh, and, and there's something that's like a little heartbreaking about that, where at the end of his life, he's like, man, I ought not to have lived my life like that. That's something I ought not to have, have done. I would take Omni back to that verse where it says, nevertheless, um, God is exceedingly merciful. But there, it, he reminds me of, um, well, in the next verse, in three, it says, 260 whatever years passed away and we had seasons of peace and we had many seasons of war and bloodshed and and all this but he says I kept these plates according to the commandments of my fathers and then I gave them to my to my son and it reminded me of this kid I taught in seminary one time who I was having a conversation with him and he just I just said um so he's like I don't I don't even want to be here and I said then why are you here and he said because my mom asked me to and I remember having a heart so won over by that and thinking to myself and telling him, you're such a good kid. The fact that mm-hmm. you would do something you don't want to do just because your mom asked you to is evidence to me of a really good kid. And, I, and he calls himself a wicked man, but I was like, you spent your life defending your people and, and you... You honored your dad by keeping these plates, even though you probably didn't want to and didn't see much, you know, um, value in doing it. But you simply did it because your dad asked you to. I would say to him, you're well on your way to a life of faith because that's what obedience looks like is doing something because your father asked you to because of the relationship you know, the hat that you have and the respect that you do. And I, and I, I just kind of learned that lesson today from, from Omni and just reminded me of that, of that kid. And, mm. and then he passes them on to this guy whose name is Amaron and Amaron and passes them on to a guy whose name is Chemish in verse eight. And, oh, I made you a little family tree here, you guys. We'll come back to these principles in just a second. See how it just kind of goes like this <laughs> and moves and he gives it to his brother and then he gives it to his son and he gives it to his son. This is what you're watching happen in the book of Omni. And it happens so fast. Yeah. In like and, eight verses. And it just made me think when, for, for example, Chemish gets verse eight and verse nine and they're this big in the book of Mormon, but he lived a whole life and yet it passed so quickly. And it just like, when I look at this, this book of Omni that moves, which is one of the littlest books in the Book of Mormon, that moves through this many people that quick. It just gave me a sense one more time of I don't have that many days on this earth. And, and it just kind of like awakened me to think, man, what if I get one verse? You know, mm. um, what, how, how am I going to spend my one verse in the history of, of this world? Uh, it gets to the, um, this last guy, Amalekai, Amaliki. 
however, I don't know how you want to say his name. <laughs> I'm a lucky. Um, and he talks to us about someone that we know whose name is King Mosiah. So he is going to live at the time of King Mosiah, who's going to have a famous king son, King Benjamin, that we'll get into next time. But King Mosiah, we learn a little story about him in the book of Omni in verse 12. And he says, I want to say to y'all something about this Mosiah who was our king. For behold, he being warned of the Lord that we should flee out of the land of Nephi and as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord should also depart out of the land with him into the wilderness. I want to take you to this worksheet of leading people. And one of those I put in this box right here is it's someone who listens to the Lord. And uh, um, Mosiah does. The Lord warns him. But that means that he was somebody who was asking and he was somebody who was listening. And then this next verse, it says, for a second time, it came to pass, he did according as the Lord had commanded him. And they departed out of the land into the wilderness, as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord. And I thought it was really neat that Mosiah had a personality of as many as want to, as many as are willing, I am going to make room for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we live in a time where the Lord is still warning us of, of things. And I think that's important that, that we're listening and that we're, that we're asking. But also that principle in leading other people to Christ is that you're willing to take a, as many as would. And that he continually relies, it says in that verse, by, by many preachings and prophecies. And we were admonished continually by the word of God, that he kept asking, that he kept listening, and that he kept doing whatever it is that the Lord was, was um, ask, having him do. Mm. Oh, that is so good. Yeah. Oh, Mosiah, we usually know Mosiah the second. So this it's is Mosiah the first. Yeah. yeah. And then you kind of learn a little bit why Benjamin was probably such a great king and what he learned from his own dad, you know, and then we'll get... Mosiah the second that will come mm. a little bit later in the Book of Mormon. Oh, that surprise. There's the timeline. Chart. Um, the end of the Book of Omni, the, this day's reading is 15 through 30, but the end of the Book of Omni has one of the verses that is maybe has affected me more than anything else in my entire life. That's actually a really bold claim, so I don't know if I really want to stand by it, but today I'll stand by it. And I remember the first time I read it, and it was in kind of a funny time in my life that I was really dedicated to my beliefs and being a Christian and trying to really believe and figure things out. Um, and I had a friend who was really, really struggling with addiction. And they had started going to the ARP meetings, the addiction recovery program, and they were going through the 12 steps and they just reached out and they were like, hey, um, I'm going through these. I think that you would be really interested in looking at them and studying them. And I was like, okay. And I was like, kind of like, oh, <laughs> great. I've never, I didn't even know any of them. And I started studying them and they are all really good, but I got to, I think it's the third one. And I opened it up. I had like this tiny little booklet and I started reading and it made me just want to cry so, so much. It is really beautifully written. If you've never studied that book, it is one of the greatest study booklets that I have ever read in my life. It completely transformed the way that I live. And the third step is trust in God, I think. I'm just making that up in my head right now. Or maybe it's give your will to him. It's something. We hope. We don't know the name. Uh, but you should just study them all because you're going to love them. But the whole purpose of that step is looking at your life and saying, I cannot do this on my own. Mm. And I need someone to help me. And so I will give my everything to the one who can help me. And it's so interesting because the booklet is written in past tense. So when you read it, it is this moment that's like you already have. When you read it out loud, it says it as if you had already done it. And I remember studying and I sat there and I was like, I don't know if I have. And I like kind of went through and I was like, yeah, of course my baptism and different moments in my spiritual journey. But I was, had this almost moment that I sat there and I was like, have I really given him everything? Have I given him my entire will? Have I given him everything that I have in my life? Is it really his? And I sat there and I kind of like was trying to work through that. And it was that day that I um, found this verse in Omni and one of my friends had it written on like a little five by seven card and that's how I found it. And it is Omni 1 verse 26. And now my beloved brethren, 
I would that you should come unto Christ, who is the Holy One of Israel, and partake of his salvation and the power of his redemption, and come unto him and offer your whole souls as an offering unto him. And continue in fasting and praying and endure to the end. And as the Lord liveth, you will be saved. But there was just something about those two words, your whole soul, that I could not get out of my head. And it made me think about that step in the ARP program, but it also just made me think about my life and have I really given him my whole soul. And I remember I was driving and it was a Sunday and I ended up at a little park and on my way to the park, I this song came on. It's, it's called So Will I, I think. Is that really true? Is that a name of a oh, Christian song? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, that's true, yes. right? It's called So Will I. And the very end, I, I listened think. to the song a lot, but it's really long. And I don't know if I'd ever gotten to the end. And at the end, it starts talking. It like talks about how, like if all of nature is like a testimony and a witness to... Um, like a creator, then I will be too. And then at the very end, the song changes. And it's the most beautiful part of the song because it goes through and it talks about um, our brother who was willing to give his entire life for us. And it has to be one of the most beautiful verses of a song ever written, ever. Like, I am obsessed with it. But there's this one line that I couldn't get out of my head, and it's, if he gave his life to love them, so will I. And... Um, I got to the park and I kind of got out and I sat down and I was thinking about the ARP program and I was thinking about this verse in Omni and I was thinking about that line in the song and I remember I got down on my knees and I just said, um, I remember and I know what Jesus has done for me and I will never be able to replicate that but please, please, please let me try to give my life to love them too. If he gave his for someone like me and all of the people around me, then I want to give mine too. I, I want to try. And it's going to be imperfect. And I'm probably going to have to do this over again. But I'm going to try to give you my whole entire soul. And I remember at, in the middle of that park, the Spirit so strongly saying, you've committed to this before. And there will be times that you commit to this again. Hmm. And I will let you commit however many times and forget however many times. As long as you just do your best. And I just love this verse so much that the, it's just such a really powerful moment that he says, listen, I'm not telling you to give your whole soul to a stranger. I'm not telling you to dedicate your entire life to someone that you don't know. I'm going to tell you first to experience who he is. Come meet him. Get to know him. Come unto Christ and partake of his salvation and the power of his redemption. Really learn what he has done for you. Figure out the magnitude of his gift to you. And then after you realize what he gave for you, maybe you want to give one of the only things that you can completely give to him and give him your whole soul. And... I just think that that's going to be imperfect. I'm going to be imperfect at that. And I'm going to have to recommit um, in the temple and maybe I did at my baptism and over and over again, maybe in a park on my knees. But I have never experienced a better life than the days when I've given my whole soul to him. And that's a day by day battle. But I love, love, love that he says, you are not giving your soul to a stranger experience him and then give your whole soul and see what it looks like to live in salvation. I think there's just, you've found that pattern again in verse 26, where he says, partake of his salvation and the power of his redemption. And when that happens, the only appropriate response is your whole soul in return. Like it just, I mean, we saw it right at the very beginning with Enos. Remember it was, he said, it was the words of eternal life that sunk deep into my heart. And, and I think it's interesting that he said, my father often spoke those words. And it makes me want to like often speak those words also, because those are the kind of words and promises, redemption and salvation that have the weight to sink deep into a heart. And then he says, and then my soul hungered. Like it was like it realized like, what is it, you know, that's, that's missing. And I think there's a really cool pattern that we're seeing through all these. In fact, Anybody who's like leading somebody to Christ, you're like, why are you acting the way that you are? And if you ask them that question, they would tell you of an experience in the woods or in the park 
where salvation and redemption and his offering sunk deep into them. And then they said, this is my response. This is my response to, to his love. Hmm. And I think we'll see it one more time with Mormon. So um, in, uh, in this uh, Words of Mormon, you saw those dates the other day. They were all BC dates. But if you look in the heading for the Words of Mormon, it's 8385. So we're out of order in the Book of Mormon here. And we find out from Mormon, who, who lives 300 years after Jesus comes, everybody else that we've been looking at is here like two and 300 years before Jesus ever comes. And all of a sudden, there's this book out of order. And Mormon is telling you, I'm about to hand over these records to my son, Roni. If you've read the Book of Mormon before, you know who these people are. They're the ending writers of the Book of Mormon the ones who will bury the plates in the ground. But if you're a first timer, you would be reading this and thinking, where are you coming from? Who, <laughs> like we, who are you? And they're talking about, we're about to witness the entire destruction of, of my people. And, and he says, and I've made an abridgment of all of these plates and, and everything. And you're like, wait, I'm, I'm try trying to catch up. And then he says, as I was making an abridgment of this long record, I found this second set of plates, the small um, the small plates. And he says, I found them. And I was like, what are these? And he starts to read them. And you remember back in Nephi, um, the whole domino of this story, Nephi is just like, I just felt impressed that I should make a second set of plates. And I don't know why, but I'm going to do it. And so he does it. And they get passed down all through that do, 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 do. And they get handed over to King, King Benjamin. And Benjamin passes them down. And they're just kept and, and throughout the Book of Mormon, we're going to see them, that they, they get handed off. And everyone's like, why, are, why am I keeping these? And they're like, I don't know. We're just supposed to keep them. <laughs> and they keep passing them down. And then it says this in verse 4. He says, and the things which are upon these plates um, please me. I love them because of the prophecies of the coming of Christ that are in them. And my fathers, knowing many of them, have been fulfilled. And I think it's really, Mormon reads through these plates and he sees in there these people that lived um, what would have been like 600 years before him um, and 300 years before Christ. And they all said, we're looking forward to this Messiah who's coming. And he is reading these and I'm just imagining him in a cave reading it and saying, these guys lived their whole lives like looking forward to someone who hadn't come yet. And, and they believed and God promised them that would happen. And Mormon lives on the other side of the fulfilled promise. Mm. And he's just like, oh man. He was like, God promised them 300 years ago he would. And I have seen that he has. And then he says at the end of four, there are more prophecies yet to be fulfilled, but they surely must come to pass. Because I have sitting right here evidence of a God who keeps his, his promises. And it strengthens his faith. To, to read those and to see the way that they live their life in that promise. And he says, so I'm going to take these little plates and I'm going um, to slide them in to the, to the record that I've already made. And he says, this is why. I do this, verse 7, for a wise purpose. For thus it whispereth me, according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me. And now I don't know all things, but the Lord does. He knows all things which are to come. And where, so he says, wherefore he worketh in me according to his will. And um, those of you who have been reading along the Book of Mormon so far can probably name verses and, and stories and feelings and experiences that you've had reading through these small plates and the impact that it's had in your life. All of that is part of that wise purpose of the Lord. He's like, there is a message that people will need someday. And Mormon, all Mormon knew was that God wanted me to. And so I did. And just imagine the good that's happened in this world because of the words that are written on the mm. small plates of, of Nephi. And I think it's really cool um, that he gives us almost like um, a pattern for the way we might want to live. That the Lord can work in us also. That he might whisper things to us. That we may never know why we did them. The end result might not be for another 1,400 years 
um, why we did that. But the Lord does work in us to help bring about um, the preservation of people, the restoration of people. The What's that verse that's in Omni? All things that are good, verse 25. When we offer our whole souls as an offering to Him and say, every day is yours, Lord. Like, do something really good with that with it, with us. And he'll whisper to us and lead us along on errands that we talked about last time to do so much that's good. And to me, that is so thrilling. I know we said this last week, but it's so thrilling to live a life like that, which is like, Mm. I'm available. I let, I want to lead other people to you. So show me how, and let me live out all my days, um, doing something like that. And it just, it just seems, seems so sweet. There's this story of, um, I actually kind of want to tell two <laughs> if I can. One is just a shorter one of a friend of mine, Sean, who was a, a junior or senior in high school. And they had a stack of uh, copies of the Book of Mormon in the seminary. And people were saying, do you want to like write your testimony in one of those? And, and the Lord whispered in him to do it. And so he did. And he wrote his name in there. And it was years later that he gets a letter from this gentleman who lives in Pakistan, who got the book. The book made its way to Paris, I think, and from Paris over to Pakistan. And because of the domino effects from there, there he's actually working on the whole story that he's going to print it up. And when it happens, I'll, I'll let you know. But I know just a portion of the story to watch the good that God that God has done simply because one junior in high school listened to a whisper and, mm. you know, and, and wrote down his testimony and, and the Lord um, worketh in me. If, if I, if I let him, if I offer him that, and I think um, I'm not going to tell the second story. I'm going to save it for another time. Y'all don't be sad about that. But I think there's something sweet about this because for Sean, one benefit from that is to see the great good that God did um, through his small offering. But another benefit from that is realizing that God knows Sean and that God trusts Sean. And I think there's something really sweet about, about that as, as well. So this is the, um, uh, this is the tender mercy for the week is just that God will work in us that he will do some of the greatest miracles in the history of the world, the changing of, of hearts, the restoring of, of belief, and he's going to do it through all of us. So that is our... Um, isn't that crazy to think about? The God of heaven and earth. Like he's orchestrating a plan in everybody's life and that you and I get to to play and, and be a part of that. And it makes it so exciting. I know it's, and it's so exciting that it's just like, look at this. Like, like Nephi is like, I feel like I should do this. And Mormon's like, I feel like I should slide this in. And those of you who know the translation process know that this part of the story was lost. And it was like, don't worry. There's another part of it that will just, I mean, just that the dominoes just mm. kind of the ripple effects just keep on, um, just keep on going. And so, uh, It's a thrilling way to live. So, all right. We will see you next week in the Book of Mosiah.